See, the concept of causality is very powerful. It is revealing to us a very important and interesting aspect of physical systems. The question is, what does it tell us? What does this uh, feature of causality? What does it tell us? It is revealing to us something very, very significant, very important. And let us have a look at it. Uh, we will explain this concept using uh, this example of spur gears in mesh with each other. So we have a pinion and a gear. Uh, let's assume that uh, the radius of this pinion is R1, the radius of the pitch circle, and the radius of the pitch circle of this gear is R2. Now, we'll take the counterclockwise directions as positive. That's what these conventions are showing us. And if you actually try to write down the, uh, if you try to write down the relationships, you see this arc length, it's given by R1 into theta 1. R1 into theta 1 is the same as this arc length because if these two pitch circles are to roll on each other without slipping, then uh, these arc lengths should be the same. Uh, these arc lengths are actually uh, generated when this uh, pinion turns by an angle of theta 1. Okay, So the angle that will be turned by the pinion will be theta 1 and the angle that will be turned by the gear will be uh, it will be psi 2 which is measured from here to here. So if you measure conventionally uh, from uh, uh, using the right uh, the convention the positive theta 2 will be measured from here and going right up to here. So you have theta 2. So <clears throat> you can write r theta 1 as this arc length. You can also write it as r2 psi 2. Okay. Now the arc lengths are the same because these two circles are rolling on each other without slipping. So you can see that uh, R1 theta 1 equal to R2 theta 2. And because of that, uh, you can. Uh, so uh, you can uh, see here, I'll just uh, explain to you. Uh, I think we could take another color. Yes. So R1 theta 1 this arc length is the same as R2 theta uh, psi 2 R2 psi 2. That's what we see from this figure. Okay. And psi 2 can actually be written as uh, pi minus theta 2. So we'll write this as R2 into pi minus theta 2. So if you differentiate this expression, you get R1 into theta 1 dot. If you differentiate it with respect to time, this becomes equal to uh, R2 into pi. You see R2 is fixed and pi also is a constant. So uh, this derivative will be zero and here you will have minus R2 into theta dot. Okay, so you see that the angular velocity, you see the directions of angular velocities are different for opposite for each of them. So this turns in this direction, this turns in this direction and that's given by this sign. And you know that uh, theta 2 is related to theta 1. Theta 2 we can write as omega 2. 
and theta one we can write as omega one, and they are related to each other. <coughs> you can see that uh, theta two dot by theta one dot. This is equal to r uh, minus r one by r two. You can also write this as a ratio of the diameters minus d one by d two. Okay, and you know that this is related to the number of teeth by the module. You know that the module is diameter divided by the number of teeth. So you know that the diameter can be written as m multiplied by the number of teeth. It's directly proportional to the number of teeth. So here you have minus m into n1 and this becomes m into n2 so this gives you uh, the relationship that theta 2 dot by theta 1 dot is related by the ratio of the number of teeth so you can see that theta 2 dot is equal to minus n1 by n2 into theta 1 okay so this is how these two uh, angular velocities of these two gears are related you can see this becomes omega 2 this becomes omega 1 and the modulus over here this becomes mu times modulus is minus n1 by n2 which is given over here okay so this is how we obtained the modulus uh, using this kinematic relationship i just derived it uh, just for refreshing uh, us uh, uh, that's all <coughs> how it is related to the number of teeth you already know this because you have studied it in your course on theory of machines so we start with this one junction over here. It represents the angular velocity of this pinion. So uh, you are applying torque on the pinion shaft. So that's input torque given by SE, uh, which is, let us say, which is the effort which is providing the effort here as torque one. It may change with time, doesn't matter. We'll just write it as torque one. So this is the torque that is applied on this pinion shaft. Naturally, can you tell me what will be the causality of this? It is, it is, uh, it's a source of effort. Naturally, the causal stroke will come here. OK. The next is. Uh, we don't have any other sources. Uh, let us start with the causality of this I element. For this I element, the integral causality will be to place the causal stroke towards the I element. So we place the causal stroke here. Now, a bond has brought in flow into this one junction. The other uh, bonds should accept it. So this uh, bond should also accept the flow. So we'll just place a causal stroke here for this bond. Uh, this transformer, it is a flow to flow converter 
So whatever flow is coming in is the same as the flow that is going out. Uh, not the same, but uh, it's related to the flow that's going out. So flow one is related to flow, flow to flow conversion. And here you see that for this one junction, one bond is bringing in flow into this one junction. The <coughs> other bond has to accept that flow. So I'm just going to uh, play causal this one junction properly according to its rule only one bond can bring in the information of flow into this one junction but what you ob observe here is that this i element goes in integral causality but this i element goes in derivative causality the, you see the causal patterns are opposite for these two so this reveals something to us. Okay, this causality, this um, problem of causality which we experience here, uh, this is revealing something to us. So let us so I hope uh, it's clear to you how we got uh, how we got this. OK, so we have the causal, um, the derivative causality over here. So this is indicating derivative causality. So this I element is in derivative causality. We can also um, do uh, causing in another way, we can have this I element in integral causality and uh, have this I element in derivative causality. So that's the other causal pattern. If we if we proceed by that means, that's also possible. <clears throat> so there are two causal patterns which are possible for this. But one thing that has to be kept in mind is that irrespective of how you do the causality, only one of the elements i elements is in integral causality the other one automatically goes in derivative causality what is the meaning of this that is what we will try to understand in this discussion let's save our work uh, you see this I element in integral causality, it's going to contribute a state, its momentum, which is the angular momentum of this uh, pinion, it's going to contribute that. And so I put it in a rectangular box. But the momentum associated with this I element, it's not fortunate enough because it's not able, it's in derivative causality. It's not its natural state, so it cannot keep a track of the past history of cause. So it is not able to contribute to the state for this system. Uh, we'll see what happens a little later. Uh, we'll have to actually correct this problem because it indicates a non-natural kind of occurrence. So uh, how should we make this correction? What we can do is uh, bring in additional dynamics. OK, so we split this bond. We break this bond. We extend it and we break it like as if you are doing surgery and you bring in this element, this C element inside. You model it, you place a zero junction here and bring a C element inside. 
the rest of the bond graph remains the same. OK. Now this additional dynamics you have brought in to correct the derivative causality. What does it mean? We will have a discussion. It's like you are placing a torsional stiffness, torsional spring between the end over here, omega 2, and between the shaft, uh, between the inertia. So between this inertia and between this end, you are bringing a torsional spring in between. So the relative motion between these two is being generated and this torsional stiffness is coming into picture. So this is the physical interpretation of bringing in this C element. What it does is that this I element goes in integral causality. This C element goes in proper integral causality. The causality of this one junction is also respected. All the causalities of the I and C elements are respected. But what happens is that additional dynamics has been brought in. Now the order of the system has increased. You have this state added, you have this state added. So now it's a third order system. There are three state variables associated with this model. Now, what does this uh, C element do? You see, by itself, uh, if you look at this physically as a physical system, uh, if you create some disturbance, it will cause oscillations. If there is a spring, it will just cause oscillations. And when there is even a small excitation, the oscillation will remain. There is no way for it to die down because we don't see any dissipative elements in this model. So this causes unceasing oscillations when excited as there is no damping. Naturally, it is necessary for us if we want to model it as if it is a natural occurrence, a natural model, we need to bring in damping also. And so we can bring in additional dynamics here. We bring in additional dynamics, bring in damping also. It's like having a combination of stiffness and damping. OK, so. What causality tells us. Is. Uh, the following. Uh, it tells a derivative causality is not natural. It implies that the model does not respect physical laws. Hence, it should be rectified. We try to rectify it. Unless deliberately introduced for control analysis or for diagnostics. So sometimes one deliberately introduces derivative causality. Uh, when you want to do structural analysis, uh, structural control properties. In that case, one deliberately introduces deli a derivative causality. But in that case, that is deliberate. But uh, in general, whenever you are having a model, when you are just modeling the system, occurrence of derivative causality means that it's not a proper model. It implies that the model is incomplete and requires introduction of additional subsystems. OK, now this aspect. Is revealed by the approach of bond graph for the modeling of dynamics of physical systems. No other technique tells you that additional dynamics is required. There is a causal violation or there is a causal problem. And so additional dynamics nature brings in this additional dynamics. Okay, nature brings in damping, nature brings in stiffness. The, the two gears in mesh may be very, very rigid, but we know that they have certain material properties and the stiffness and damping are their respective material properties which have been lumped over here, which have been approximated here. So nature has its own way of bringing in, of eliminating derivative causality. Okay. 